Kit, what, what do you make of this latest uh, turmoil around the Greek uh, bailout story? It's been kept at bay, even though it's mm. been there all the time. It's been kept at bay as, in terms of a, something that markets need to focus on and, and, and worry about unduly every day. Yeah, it doesn't. As a story, no. I mean, Greece's problems. So there isn't enough economic growth. That their debt is un still unsustainable, uh, and their budget fiscal position isn't really working because there isn't there isn't enough growth at the e end of the day. So more debt relief at some point in, in the future, um, and and more problems until until someone waves a magic wand and gets the growth story happening again, which I think is going to take a, a really long time. Um, that that said, everything else I think is is politics in the sense that I, I think we've crossed the line some time ago that, that Greece is staying in the in, in the euro and um, uh, and then everything that looks looks as if it might sort of force something else other than that is posturing at least I don't mm. see how you can have come this far to, to walk back to where we were a couple of years ago well it looks as if we're going to go to 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 a summer of, of brinkmanship again either guy or I will probably be, be down there 11388 is where we are on euro dollar kit um, Vasilius also writes for Bloomberg First Word, and he created this piece, which is about the trade-weighted euro. And this is probably uh, more to do with Greek risk rising, Fed on cautious mode, ECB more interested in transmission mechanism than currency. And the currency is still 10% below where it was in its 2013 high. What next for the, the euro? Because verbal intervention tends to come in at around 114. Yeah, I don't think it can go very much higher than this, just given the lack of growth um, and given the danger that if it does stay around here and, uh, and then we don't see any sort of push on for the global economy, I think the European economy will start weakening again, uh, weakening again over the course of the next few months. I mean, there has been a change at the ECB to focus, to refocus on how do we get more money into the European economy as opposed to, oh my goodness, we need to get the euro weaker, which was the story at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. So they have changed, but um, if, if on your chart, you know, they engineered a rapid fall from 128 to 110 on that, mm -hmm. on that uh, trade-weighted index. Uh, 118, you know, we are, we're, we're halfway back. Round about here, you start getting, hang on a second, we don't want any more strength. If, if we could transition from uh, Grexit to Brexit with the... Uh, you did it seamlessly. Yeah, with, just, just, just by altering one consonant. Um, current account data that was uh, released last week, did this give you sleepless nights, Kit? The, the, the extent of vulnerability of the UK economy to flows of FDI, whether that's our big UK companies returning profits or not so much profits back to the UK. What worries you about that? Well, there's, there's, I mean, the first thing about the current account data that worries me is just we're almost at £100 billion on an annual basis, which mm. is a sort of mind-blowing number, frankly. 7% of GDP in the fourth quarter is huge. The, the fact that the driver is 25 of this is, is not, it's not our trade in goods, it's not our trade in services. This is about the income from investment overseas by large UK-based multinationals who um, they are mostly earning less out of commodities and particularly oil. Yeah. You start uh, to wonder whether really weaker oil prices are good for the UK economy if that's what the yeah, well, account is based I'm, on. There's, there's, there's this thing playing in my head that says are multinationals countries or are they companies? Because do, do we see the money that's you know when when a large UK domiciled multinational with global shareholders that that has intercompany loans and, yeah. and is huge do we see that money in the UK? I mean, their employees aren't in the UK. Their shareholders aren't necessarily in the UK. So, so there's, I, I, I look at it a bit as saying, I think this is more complicated. Am I allowed to differentiate between the current account and the capital account and say, current account deficit bad, requires capital inflows, if what's happening is, A, another huge company is deciding this week to borrow money as opposed to mm. put money back. It's very... It's very messy, but, I mean, it's come right back to the beginning. That first number, £100 billion a year current account deficit, at a time when you're thinking of floating off into the middle of the North Atlantic and further away from Europe, cannot be good for the pound. It's, it's just certainly not in terms worse. of vol. I mean, this is, I mean, everybody's writing about it. We talk about it literally every day and we monitor it. But we are back at those levels that we saw in terms of volatility back in June of last year. And I think... Really, that's in, in the run-up to the Scottish referendum. But this volatility, I, I love what you wrote in your notes, which was long oil and short sterling via sterling knocking. 
Yeah, I mean, that was part of my sort of re reaction to some of this data, is that if, if the current account deficit has been driven by weak oil, yes. then the only way it improves is if oil prices bounce. Um, we're a bit sceptical on that at the moment, are we? We're a bit sceptical on that. That would be better for Norway than it would for the UK. <laughs> All ends up, so I'm pretty comfortable with that. Yes, I want to remain short sterling, um, and, and short sterling against oil through one form or another I got doesn't you. look like a stupid idea. I, I'll grant you, on a day when oil prices are going down, we could just go short, short the whole lot of them. I'm not going to kill you for a 1% move on oil. Thank okay. you.